Here's a claim that might make you do a double take. This wild-looking product, where we're raising each number k to the power 2k minus p minus 1, is supposedly always an integer when p is prime. Now, if you're like me, your first instinct is to think that can't be right. Those exponents go negative, which should give us fractions all over the place. But mathematics has a way of surprising us, so let's dig in and see what's really going on. All right, whenever you encounter A, claim this bold. The first thing to do is get your hands dirty with some examples. Let's be good little mathematicians and check if this actually works for small primes. Starting with P equals 2, we get the simplest possible case, just one term in our product. We're computing 1 to the power of negative 1, which is just 1. So far, so good, but this is almost too simple to be convincing. For P equals 3, things get slightly more interesting. We have 1 to the negative 2 times 2 to the 0. Now, any number to the power 0 is 1, so this becomes 1 times 1, which is 1, still an integer, and our confidence is building. Now, for P equals 5, where things get genuinely interesting. Look at these exponents, negative 4, negative 2, 0, and positive 2. This is where we really see those negative exponents in action, creating what should be messy fractions. Let's see what this chaos actually evaluates to. So we have 1 times 1 fourth times 1 times 16. At first glance, this looks like it should be some ugly fraction. But watch what happens when we multiply these together. All those terms collapse down to just 16 over 4. And here comes the magic moment. It's exactly 4. A perfect integer. Okay, so the pattern holds for our test cases. But now comes the real challenge. How do we prove this for every prime number that exists? Here's the key insight. A rational number is an integer if and only if its denominator divides its numerator when written in lowest terms. Or, thinking about it in terms of prime factorization, every prime that appears in the denominator must appear at least as many times in the numerator. So our job is to analyze the prime factorization of this product. To make this precise, let's introduce a handy piece of notation. The q adic valuation, v sub q of n, simply counts how many times the prime q divides n. For instance, v sub 2 of 12 equals 2, because 12 equals 4 times 3, and 4 is 2 squared. It's like asking how much of this prime q is baked into this number n. So here's our plan. We need to show that for any prime q less than p, the power of q in our product q of p is non-negative. If we can do this, then q of p has no debt in its denominator. It's genuinely an integer. Notice we only care about primes smaller than p, because any prime q that's at least as big as p can't possibly divide any of the numbers 1 through pe minus 1, so it contributes nothing to our product. Now here's where valuations really shine. When you have a product of powers, the valuation of the whole thing is just the weighted sum of the valuations of the pieces. Think of it like this. If I raise k to some power, I'm multiplying the q content of k by that power. So the total q content of our product is this weighted sum you see here. Now, staring at this sum, you might feel a bit stuck. It's not obvious how to evaluate it directly. But here's where we can pull out a classic trick from the calculus playbook. Except instead of integration by parts, we'll use summation by parts. It's the discrete analog, and it's about to transform this seemingly intractable sum into something much more manageable. Let me give this sum a name. Let's call it S sub Q. The key insight is to rewrite each V sub Q of K in terms of something we can work with more easily, the valuations of factorials. Here's the setup. 
let E sub K be the Q adic valuation of K factorial. Think of E sub K as the total Q content that's built up by the time we've multiplied together all numbers from 1 to K. With this definition, V sub Q of K is just the difference between consecutive E values. It's the new Q content contributed by the number K itself. Now watch what happens when we substitute this difference back into our sum. Beautiful. Now we have our sum written in terms of these E differences. This is exactly the setup we need for summation by parts. Let's expand this out and see the magic happen. I've split this into two separate sums, which will let us apply the summation by parts technique. Now here's the key move. To combine these sums, I need the indices on the E terms to line up. So let me re-index this second sum. By substituting j equals k minus 1, the second sum now runs from 0 up to p minus 2. Perfect. Now I can start combining these sums. The e sub 0 term vanishes since 0 factorial is 1, and I'll pull out the boundary term from the first sum. Look what we've accomplished. I've isolated the boundary term. That's the p minus 3 times e sub p minus 1 part. And now we have two very similar sums that we can combine. Now comes the beautiful moment. These two sums have almost identical structure. Let's see what happens when we combine them by looking at the difference in their coefficients. The coefficients differ by exactly negative 2. And when the dust settles, we get this much cleaner expression. This is the power of summation by parts. It's transformed our complicated sum into something we can actually work with. Now let's unpack what these E terms actually mean by substituting back the definition. So our mission has crystallized. Prove that this expression is always non-negative. If we can do that, we'll have shown that Q of P is indeed an integer. We're in the home stretch now. To prove our inequality, we need to dive into the structure of factorial valuations. Fortunately, number theory gives us exactly the tool we need. Legendre's formula is one of those beautiful results that makes explicit something that might seem mysterious. It tells us exactly how many times a prime Q divides n factorial. The idea is elegant. We count multiples of Q, then multiples of Q squared, then Q cubed, and so on. And don't worry about that infinite sum. Only finitely many terms are actually non-zero. After all the algebra settles, our problem reduces to proving this inequality for each power of Q. Let me set m equals q to the j, and n equals p minus 1, and then we need to show this. Here's what we need to prove. The left side counts how many complete blocks of size m fit into n, weighted by n minus 2. The right side is twice the sum of how many blocks fit into each k from 1 to n minus 1. Intuitively, we're comparing the bulk contribution against the accumulated contribution. To tackle this sum, let's think about it geometrically. I'll write n as a times m plus r, where a is the quotient and r is the remainder when we divide n by m. Picture the numbers from 1 to n minus 1 arranged in blocks of size m. We have a complete blocks and then a partial block with r remaining numbers. In the first block, the floor values are all 0. In the second block, they're all 1, and so on. The last complete block has floor values of a minus 1, and the partial block has r terms, each with floor value a. Now I can use the classic formula for the sum of the first several integers. The sum 0 plus 1 plus 2 up to a minus 1 is just a times a minus 1 all over 2. Now let's substitute this back into our inequality and see what happens. Plugging in n equals am plus r and our formula for the sum, we get this somewhat intimidating looking inequality. But don't worry, it's about to simplify beautifully. 
Time for some algebra magic. When I expand both sides, look what emerges. We have some terms that are begging to be canceled. The a squared m terms cancel out perfectly. And we're left with something much more manageable. Let me gather all the terms on one side. Now everything's on the left side. I can combine these r terms. After simplifying, we get this clean form that's ready for factoring. And now I can pull out the common factor of a. Beautiful. Our complex inequality has boiled down to this simple form. a times the quantity m minus r minus 2, greater than or equal to 0. This is the moment where all our hard work pays off. Now, since a is non-negative, we have two cases to consider. If a is 0, meaning m is bigger than n, then our original inequality becomes 0 greater than or equal to 0, which is trivially true. The interesting case is when a is at least 1, because then we need a minus r minus 2 to be non-minus negative. But wait, couldn't r be as large as m minus 1? That would make this expression negative. And here's where the magic happens. This is the moment we finally use the fact that p is prime. Up until now, we've just been doing algebra, but primality is about to save the day. Let's think about what we have. Since n equals p minus 1, we can write p as am plus r plus 1. Now, what if r really were m minus 1? Let's see what happens. Substituting this worst-case scenario gives us p equals a plus 1 times m. But this is disaster. It means m divides p. And since we're in the case where a is at least 1, we know that m is at most n, which is p minus 1. So we'd have m is greater than 1 and less than p, and m would divide p. But that's impossible. A prime number, by definition, has no divisors other than 1 and itself. We can't have m dividing p when m is strictly between 1 and p. This contradiction shows our assumption was wrong. So r cannot equal m minus 1. The remainder must be at most m minus 2, which means m minus r minus 2 is at least 0. Primality has rescued us. And with that beautiful argument, we've proven that the q-adic valuation of q of p is non-negative for every prime q less than p. The pieces are all falling into place. Let's step back and admire what we've built. We've shown that every prime has non-negative valuation in Q of P. For primes smaller than P, we proved this with our intricate inequality argument. For primes P or larger, they simply don't appear in any of the factors, so their valuation is automatically zero. Either way, no prime appears in the denominator, so Q of P must be an integer. That wild product we started with, with all its negative exponents and apparent chaos, is indeed always an integer when p is prime. Mathematics has once again surprised us with its hidden order. But wait, there's more. Our journey through valuations has uncovered something beautiful. Hidden within our proof is an elegant alternative way to write q of p. This factorial representation falls out naturally from our valuation work. Now, the integrality of q of p becomes a statement about divisibility of factorials, that this product of squared factorials in the denominator actually divides the power of p minus 1 factorial in the numerator. It's a stunning bridge between our original combinatorial product and the familiar world of factorials. And just to make sure we appreciate how special primes are, let's check what happens for a composite number. Take p equals 4. Our formula gives q of 4 equals 3 over 2, definitely not an integer. This confirms that the primality of p isn't just a technicality. It's absolutely essential to the magic. 
And that wraps up our journey through this fascinating theorem. If you enjoyed diving deep into the beauty of number theory and discovering how prime numbers work their magic in unexpected ways, please give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for more mathematical adventures and hit that notification bell so you never miss when we explore the next amazing theorem. Until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and remember, mathematics is full of surprises waiting to be discovered.